This is when we do our stand-up bit. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for hauling yourselves out of bed uh, after the Saturday night parties to come hear about ATSC 3.0, which is the upcoming digital TV standard, um, and which has a lot of things that have us very worried, as it is currently in development. Um, this is a pretty small crowd, so I think probably the best way to do this is Corinne and I will, like, you know, kind of talk about what the issue is and then just leave plenty of time for audience questions. This is a, uh, obviously, this is a digital TV transmission standard, which means we can get all the way down a whole lot of rabbit holes if given the time, um, which I don't think would be, you know, it just melt everybody's eyes out of their head if we did that for too long. Um, but just as... By way of quick introduction, I'm Meredith Rose, um, Senior Policy Counsel. I work for a group called Public Knowledge, uh, which is a DC-based consumer advocacy group. Um, and we work on a wide range of tech issues um, from you know intellectual property to privacy to net neutrality to competition and antitrust to platform regulation to uh, broadcast standards and public interest broadcast standards. And I'm Corey McSherry. I'm the legal director at the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, we are a digital rights advocacy group, and um, we sort of work on all things tech. We have a litigation arm. So some of us are litigators, some of us are lobbyists, some of us are grassroots advocates, um, and uh, some of us build technologies to protect your privacy and security and then teach folks how to use them. Um, we also have uh, what's called the Electronic Frontiers Alliance, which is our sort of alliance of uh, connecting local groups that are interested in these kinds of issues, including Electronic Frontiers Georgia. Great. Um, so the story of ATSC 3.0 is a little complicated, and so I'm going to do sort of a brief history lesson because it only really makes sense when you sort of situate it in the context of broadcast TV over the years and sort of how we ended up in this place. Um, so when we talk about, actually, before we even do that, um, show of hands, who remembers the digital TV transition, the DTV transition? Okay, cool. Um, that's most people, yeah. Who remembers before cable existed? <laughs> There we go. All right. Um, that'll, so that'll help. Uh, so to, to rewind a bit, so when we talk about broadcast TV, we're talking about over-the-air television. We are talking about TV that comes across on the airwaves and the electromagnetic spectrum, complete with hand gestures. Um, and, you know, the ideal is you plug your TV into a power outlet and nothing else to be able to get these signals. Uh, back in the day, you had bunny ears. Now you can just, it, the receivers are baked into your TV. Um, and we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum. So uh, the FCC is the, uh, is the in, uh, independent agency of the federal government that is charged with managing the spectrum. And so their job, basically, they give licenses to operate um, for broadcasters to say, you may use this slice of the spectrum in this designated geographical area. Um, all of these licenses are pegged to specific geographies. So you don't get a nationwide license unless you're like the Department of Defense. Uh, but basically their job is to sort of direct traffic and say like, you're over here, you're over here, make sure signals don't bump up against each other, uh, make sure everything gets through nice and clear. Um, so, you know, the trajectory of the use of spectrum over the years, especially in broadcast, has been getting more and more people into smaller and smaller slices as the technology gets better. Um, so the technology gets better, it allows for more efficient transmission of data and information and images and sound um, on smaller and smaller slices of the spectrum, which allows more and more people to get in and use the spectrum. Um, so spectrum also is used for things like radio broadcasts, it's used for your GPS, it's used for satellite, it is used for uh, Wi-Fi operates in a very big block of spectrum that is unlicensed. So, you know, all this kind of, if it travels over the airwaves, it goes through on the spectrum. Um, so if you go all the way back, so prior to 1961, so you had originally, you know, some folks may remember, you know, you had three major, you had three TV channels, basically. Um, and they were, nat, you know, local rebroadcasts of national broadcasters in a lot of cases. Um, in the late 1950s, the FCC opened up a new block of spectrum for TV broadcasters, which is the UHF spectrum. Uh, and said, all right, now we're going to have like a bunch more TV broadcasters that can operate in this range. Uh, the problem was that the TVs up until that point 
had only been baked in with the ability to receive the much narrower band of spectrum that the big three were operating in. And so this new band of spectrum was opened up for broadcasters and these new broadcasters, which were by and large local operations, um, couldn't actually reach the customers because the customers had television sets that weren't program that basically weren't capable of receiving this new block of spectrum. Uh, and so the FCC, you know, uh, basically said, well, this is a problem. Congress passed this law called the, uh, what was it called? The All Channels Act, 1961. And the All Channels Act basically um, came in and said that the FCC can now mandate that all new devices have the capacity to receive these broadcast stations. So the FCC can come in and say, you must receive both the old, the VHF standard, which was the, the original broadcast TV block, much smaller, but now they also must receive the UHF. Um, and this basically uh, has been interpreted over the years to grant the FCC the ability to um, regulate broadcast TV devices, basically receivers, to say, like, you need to be able to interpret whatever the signal is that we are transitioning from or to. Uh, so that was passed in 1961. Um, they, the, so this is a, I'm trying to like figure out how to much to elide over here. Um, part of getting a license to broadcast on the electromagnetic spectrum, if you are a broadcaster, is you have public interest obligations. Um, you have to serve the local community. These licenses are local, they're geographically limited. So you, get, you don't get a broadcast license that's nationwide, you get one to broadcast through the Atlanta metro area, and you have public interest obligations, which means you need to, in your programming, reflect the local interest and priorities of your community. So that includes things like weather, that includes emergency alerts, that includes news coverage, political coverage, whatever it happens to be, but you have to actually bring this to your community. Um, notably, cable channels do not have this. Cable channels travel over an actual physical wire. They don't broadcast across the spectrum, so the FCC doesn't have the same kinds of sort of carrots and sticks that they have over broadcast TV. So all of that is context until we get up to the digital TV transition, um, which happened throughout the aughts, really. Um, I think the final switch was flipped in like 2009. Uh, but basically, there was a new broadcast standard, which was called the ATSC standard. We now call it ATSC 1.0. Uh, 2.0, no one knows what happened to it. We moved straight from 1 to 3 for some reason. Uh, ATSC was the digital TV transition. This was going to allow broadcasters to not only cram a lot more signals into a much, much smaller band of spectrum, like wildly increasing the efficiency of how many people could broadcast over a slice of spectrum. It was going to improve picture quality. It was going to uh, enable multiple levels of high definition. Uh, you know, it, it, was, it was this very big deal, basically. And broadcasters sort of had this problem where they, when they first developed it, they're like, well, we're going to broadcast this new DTV standard. Um, but no TVs exist which accept it right now. They were still, they were facing the UHF problem. All the existing stuff on the market only dealt with the old broadcast standard. Uh, and so they would nudge the FCC like, hey, come on, come on. You got to start mandating that these TVs have to be able to accept ATSC transmissions. Uh, and the FCC said, okay, well, we can do that, but... You are asking to transition an entire nation of customers over from their old TVs. And at some point, you want to flip a switch and stop the old broadcasting method, which means that those TVs are no longer going to work. So we have an entire country worth of TVs that we need to replace um, or retrofit so that they can get these signals. Because if we don't do that, there are going to be whole swaths of the country who don't have access to the internet in a lot of cases, who are now going to lose the usability of their TV signal. Um, and this was a very big uphill fight. Uh, anybody who remembers it probably remembers that like around 2008, 2009, the government had to start just giving people rebates basically for buying uh, digital antennas. There was a lot of money that had to get poured into this. Um, you know, basically like low income communities, especially these, these, you know, digital antennas were not cheap and you were asking people to go out and buy these not cheap pieces of equipment to retrofit their old TVs. It was, it was this huge, I, I think officially, the legal term for it is a debacle. Um, but it happened. It eventually got over the line. Uh, and now I'm actually going to kick it to Corinne, 
because we're going to talk about some of the stuff that <laughs> happened after the ATSC transition and uh, some stuff that has broadcasters very concerned. Yeah, so, so one of the things that happened after that um, was there were a number of different kinds of services that sprang up to try to figure out, okay, so people still do want... I mean, a big part of this was an explosion of cable. So suddenly everybody is getting their TV, their video, whatever, via cable. But there are people who still want access to broadcast. Um, they want their local programming. Sometimes what they want especially is their local sports programming. That's where some of the money is. Um, and But, you know, just like local community programming. And it could, it, for, for many people, it got harder and harder to figure out how to access just broadcast TV in a way that was cheap. Um, and, you know, so you didn't have to pay for cable, you know, like currently now, at least where I live, if you want to watch local sports, you need ESPN. Like, you can't really watch local sports. In, in a way that's realistic, which I find very irritating because, like, I paid for that fucking stadium. Oops, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm just saying. Anyway, so so one of the things that happens is that a bunch of different kinds of services spring up to try to provide people with alternative ways of accessing local broadcast TV if they want that for less than a cable subscription for less than the sort of major TV networks want to want them to pay for it. Um, and there's different ways in which people experiment with how to do that. One of the first services is called Aereo. Um, so Aereo starts in uh, 2012. And what they do is they basically, you could, if you were you know, a subscriber to Aereo, you could rent a TV antenna, a little teeny weeny antenna, like physically, it was like an antenna um, from Aereo. And that antenna would allow you to select the programming that you wanted, broadcast programming, and essentially stream it to your device, um, to your television usually. And um, this was a service that actually millions of people were signed up for at first. And, um, but the TV networks were not happy with this. They said, no, 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 no. That is what's called a public performance. You're retransmitting our programming. We get to decide how our programming is transmitted and to where. And this, you know, independent startup, you have to get a license from us. If you're gonna, if you this is a public performance of our programming and we get to control that, not you random independent startup person. Um, so Aereo said, no, actually, we're just doing, we're just sort of making it easier for people to do what they could do anyway if they had their little rabbit ears in their own house, but we just, you know, do it in a slightly different way. Uh, so this case worked its way all, all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court unfortunately ruled against, unfortunately in my view, ruled against Aereo and said, no, this actually does, it looks to us like you. this is just like um, a cable network. You are just sort of mimicking a cable network and cable companies actually have to license broadcast programming and so you do too. And so Aereo went out of business in 2014. Um, <clears throat> it sort of, it, and many people looked at that decision and it was very much a little like Supreme Court kind of wiggling around like, well, looks like cable, we're gonna treat it like cable. But actually, technically, that wasn't really accurate. Um, I also think that they just had that this sort of gut thing of like, Aereo is just trying to be too clever by half. But you know, that's what innovation often looks like, is actually someone being clever and doing something new and interesting. Okay, so, but they'll go out of business. Then in 2016, you have an organization called Filmon. So Filmon says, okay, fine, we, if we're going to be stuck within like the cable legal construct, because like there's a whole in the Copyright Act, there's um, a, a way of thinking about retransmission for cable. Um, so we're going to try to do that. So um, they said we were what basically they set up um, technology that would allow them to uh, transmit again just broadcast by paying a fee because there is a section of the Copyright Act that says that cable systems can do that. They, they pay a set fee and they can retransmit broadcast. Um, so Filmon tried to set up a system like that 
and um, but the but it, but Philmon was an internet based system, and that worked its way up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Ninth Circuit says, well, you don't look like cable enough to be able to fall into this category. Okay, so. And again, all they're trying to do, the, all of these services, what they are doing is they are trying to help people get access, you know, via the new and emerging devices to local programming, news, weather, community programming, and so on. And in fact, Congress had decided um, when they sort of wrote the, um, the cable um, amendments to the Copyright Act, they wanted people to actually have access to that. They thought it was an important value that people should have access to local broadcast um, programming because it's one of the areas with the only areas where you're really going to get that kind of community programming um, and a lot of people still value that so but okay so Philmon goes down not like cable enough um, and then most recently there's an organization or there's a um, company called Lowcast that emerges um, mostly out of New York so Lowcast tries to take advantage of another provision in copyright law and this provision says, again, because Congress thought it was important that people have access to local community programming, they said, if you're a nonprofit um, surviving only on donations, then you can, you can basically get out of having to sort of pay a license to every different local network in order to convey broadcasting. Um, so Lowcast says, great, they put themselves in place. They are going to be, they are nonprofit. They do take donations um, and they, you know, allow people to sort of be members like many nonprofits do. Um, and again, they, but they're taking advantage of this, of this provision of the law that should allow nonprofits to also retransmit broadcast signals um, over the internet. Um, this too goes down. And the theory here from um, the Southern District of New York is, well, you took donations in order to help, and some of that money went to expanding your service to more and more areas. So that is not nonprofit enough. So you're not cable enough. You're not nonprofit enough. You know, you're not. But you're you also too much like cable. But you're also too much like cable. So, um, so Lowcast also um, get the. Uh, court rules against it and they also shut down um, so what we sort of see as a theme here is look there is demand for broadcast still clearly there is demand Lowcast had three million subscribers in the just in the New York area <clears throat> people want this the technology exists that's not the problem the problem is copyright law which has been my theme for the past two days, um, getting in the way of really what people actually want. And also, it's not just copyright laws in the way of them. It's also because the networks, they want to, everyone to pay to license their programming. Um, and, you know, sure, people want to get paid. It's understandable. But the other sort of theme is that where we started with, the whole point of broadcast is it's taking advantage of a public resource. And there's a long history in this country where we sort of thought spectrum is public resource, broadcast builds on a public resource, therefore the public actually is owed, right? We have, there's a public interest here and there's a public right to access certain kinds of programming. And a lot of these networks are taking advantage of that, but they're not, you know, they're getting all the benefits and not sort of paying the, what I think of as the public price. We are not getting the benefit of our investment as the public. Um, and that's, you know, that is a very unfortunate context. So to set up against all of this, um, if you are a broadcaster right now, on top of all of, you know, what you see is clearly an assault on your intellectual property rights, um, you are also now facing a new spread of competition. Um, you are facing up against cable companies, you know, which has been in the works since the late 80s, um, probably earlier, um, but has really been a dominant force, especially in the 90s and onward. Um, you're now facing competition from streaming services like Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, um, and so you have seen the sort of, you know, if you followed the spacing uh, over the last few years, you've just seen waves upon waves of consolidation, especially vertical up and down with programming. So NBC Universal uh, and Comcast 
uh, you know, all sort of merging together into one unholy entity. Um, and so they look around and what they see is not, we are using a public good to provide a public service. They see, oh no, we're not making as much money as Netflix or Amazon or, you know, any of these other streaming services. Um, and so why should we have to be burdened by all these public interest obligations uh, when Netflix is not sort of ignoring that fundamentally these are different services. So enter ATSC 3.0. Again, the old, the current standard is 1.0. The new one is 3.0. Don't ask me what happened to 2.0. Nobody knows. It's a mystery for the ages. Um, so there has been this, you know, as again, with the trajectory of technology in the broadcast space, it has been how do we get more efficient use of the spectrum that we have so we get more people on it, we can deliver more content over smaller and smaller bands of spectrum. Um, ATSC 3.0 does that. Um, the original, the first pass at this standard um, was developed by essentially a bunch of broadcasters um, getting their technical people together. They developed this uh, ATSC 3.0 protocol, which is, has a bunch of subparts to it, and this is important. Um, now, the FCC has to approve whatever the new broadcast standard is because they are the ones who have to mandate that receivers all comply with this new standard. You can't just have a bunch of private organizations go out and say, this is the new standard. They have to run it through the FCC first. Um, and so some of these subparts were delivered to the FCC and the FCC, and it was things like, you know, here's the spectrum band compliance that you have to do. It was the very technical spectrum, broad, here's the power, you know, wattage requirements that you need to be able to broadcast and receive. Um, all very, very technical dry stuff. FCC signed off on that, said, okay, well, you know, you have to keep simulcasting in the 1.0 standard. You know, you can't switch off the 1.0 broadcasts right now, which are the standard DTV broadcasts that all of our TVs have to legally be capable of receiving. You still must do simulcasting. Um, but ATSC 3.0 has a bunch of other provisions in it. And so in addition to being more efficient use of the spectrum, ATSC 3.0 tries to do um, some kind of pretty cool things, um, you know, more specific um, weather and emergency alerts that they could do basically um, utilizing the fact on the assumption that viewers have an internet connection in their home. Uh, and they say, oh, well, by your IP address, we can tell where you are. We can offer more targeted emergency alerts, more targeted weather alerts. Um, having an internet uh, upload upstream connection uh, means that we can also do things like interactive TV. So you could have uh, the use case that gets trotted out a lot is during the commercial break during children's programming, you can have an educational quiz where the kids can input an answer and, you know, they'll figure out and they could do all kinds of um, sort of tailored programming on the educational sphere, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about this from public interest advocates, namely not everybody has an internet connection, even in the year of our Lord 2023. Um, certainly doesn't, not everybody has a reliable one, but, uh, earlier this summer, you know, this is again, this is an experimental, uh, still at this stage protocol. It is being voluntarily rolled out by some broadcast stations across the country. There are some ATSC 3.0 receivers on the market. I think there's three of them now. Um, they are private. They are gigantic boxes that you have to buy. They're like 200 bucks a pop. Um, I think there's one that has been prototyped that could theoretically be done for under a hundred dollars but the manufacturer just doesn't have the scale to actually mass produce it. Um, and you can get some ATSC 3.0 enabled TVs, which are very expensive because they are the brand, they're like $7,000 TVs. They're, they're top line, brand new things. So this is all very new. Most people are not going to interact with an ATSC 3.0 signal yet. Um, enter a YouTube reviewer of TV tuners. Uh, he posted a review earlier in the summer in which he pointed out, he went through and he had one of the these early sort of almost preprint um, ATSC 3.0 tuner boxes. And he posted a video which said, hey, uh, I noticed that when I tried to use these to tune in to some of the ATSC 3.0 simulcasts that are going on on my local stations, um, I got a DRM notice that my box is not allowed to view this broadcast. It's an ATSC 3.0 box. Uh, I don't know what's going on. And so he tried to chase down the you know, the actual broadcasters. He tried to chase down the engineers um, and kind of no one would really give him a straight answer on this. So while this is happening in the background, you know, we have this same 
process that was going on with the original digital TV transition, where broadcasters want to use the shiny new standard. No one has the equipment for it yet. There's no affordable equipment for it yet. They say, well, we need the government to force a market for this. We need to force the transition over. Dear FCC, please mandate that all these new devices have to take ATSC 3.0. And the FCC was like, you guys have a lot to work out on your own. Like, please go talk to each other first. Um, and so they have these sort of public working groups that are going on right now where they're running through the standards. Um, and then this video happened in June. My organization, Public Knowledge, is part of these working groups. And it turns out that the broadcasters in their um, sort of existential freak out about having to encounter another area or another low cast or another one of these retransmission services have baked in multiple levels of DRM standards into this full big like package of ATSC 3.0 technical standards. Um, and not only that, but if you want to make a 3.0 device, you must agree to the whole package, including the ones that were not approved by the FCC. You must go to the eight, the uh, eighth, A3A. There's an acronym soup here that I will not melt your brain with, but basically the licensing body that sets the standards is a private organization and is run exclusively basically by broadcasters. Um, and you have to go to them and get like the seal of approval with the like special sticker on it. And then in order to do that, you have to agree to what have turned out to be all kinds of crazy DRM standards, um, including the ability to limit uh, uh, DVR recording or turn off DVR recording or auto delete a DVR recording after 24 hours. Uh, and all of these kinds of micromanaging tools that would basically eliminate home recording um, on top of other things. And so folks have been raising the alarm bells about this. We've been getting the runaround uh, by the broadcasters who say, well, I can't do that. And then when we point to the part of the standard that has that, they say, well, you shouldn't have access to that part of the standard. Why, do you <laughs> Why are you doing that? Um, so it's been a very frustrating process. Um, and it is still up in the air and still sort of being negotiated in these public working groups. Um, but it is a concern that basically out of this reaction against things like Aereo and sort of low cast and, and retransmission services, this fear of piracy um, has led to the baking in of these technical standards, which at the end of the day, fundamentally would overturn uh, on, a, on a technical level decisions like the Sony Betamax decision, uh, which is a Supreme Court case from the 80s, which essentially said, yeah, home recording is a fair use under copyright law. Um, this would obviate that on a technical level. And so there's a lot of concern right now. It is still very much in the working group being hashed out information gathering phase. Um, and so it's frustrating because this is still several years off from being implemented as a practical matter. Um, it is not going to happen tomorrow. It's probably not going to happen next year or even the year after that. Um, but we are staring down the barrel of another major TV protocol transition, which could potentially have very devastating consequences for the way that just regular people consume broadcast television. And so just to build on that a little bit, because um, there's a couple things. So, so one is the sort of like baking in um, the DRM is obviously troublesome and concerning and but not just because it's sort of like technically working around your fair use rights um but also because the way they're setting it up we've seen it before we've seen it before in the context of dvds and dvd players so back in the day also if you made a dvd player i uh, wanted to market it you had to get also a seal of approval from an industry group often that would include people who were your competitors um, and, and basically you had to show that you were complying with certain obligations and one of the things that that did is it meant that uh, the development of the dvd player you know technology was just hopelessly retarded it was like basically printers you know <laughs> like the, be, there was a technology for a long time that people really liked and used a lot but people really couldn't innovate because it was slowed down because they had to go and get the seal of approval from this industry body. Um, and you know, whatever it's in the past, we don't care anymore about those players, but that was like two decades of innovation that did not happen. And it is, seems to me extremely likely that this is what's going to happen again. 
Um, the broadcasters say, well, like, we need DRM, we need this encryption because security. But then I don't really explain what, what the security problem is that, they, that they're worried about. And in fact, the, the thing is that there's a different kind of security that we should be worried about, which is user privacy. Because one of the things that this is also going to enable is for broadcasters to do what every other corporation is doing, if it possibly can right now, which is collect information about users. So let's say your kid plays that quiz. Now, you know, what kind of information are they gonna get about your household, what you're watching, what you're doing, what is interesting to you, what isn't interesting to you. That is part of this transition too that is not being discussed really well. And like there, I don't know, I would like my signals to be encrypted. Like th there's actually an argument there that's very different from the argument that's of interest to broadcasters. I mean, we've seen this with smart TVs already where um, like Samsung got busted for this, but lots of other smart TVs and other devices are, you know, information that they're collecting is just going over the internet for anyone to see as if they want to know how to do it, which is, I, I don't know how to do it, but trust me, there's lots of people that do. It's not that hard. Um, and are they investing the time to actually encrypt that bit as opposed to, you know, imposing encryption on, on you that only they control, right, which is really different. And it comes back to kind of the theme of, um, at least for EFF, you know, we always think you should be in control of your own device. You should be in control of the information that has been collected about you by your device. You should be able to um, open up that device, inspect it, figure out what what it's up to, what's, what it's doing, and then actually, actually control what it's doing so that it actually serves your interests and not the interests of the person who sold it to you. Um, and this is yet another area where um, there's a lot of powers that be that are moving us away from that place. Now, the one thing I will say is I don't think, it is my impression that the FCC s understands this. They see that this is a thing that might happen. They are worried about it, is my understanding. Um, and at some point, I think they're going, there's gonna be a request for sort of public commentary. And it, part of the reason we're here today is to sort of like start laying the groundwork because there is gonna be a point where we need to activate people to speak up and make noise so we don't end up in the situation like we did with DVD players where a lot happened and no one really knew about it until it was too late. So the idea is like, well, let's not have that happen this time. Well, we just did all of ATSC 3.0 in 30 minutes. Woo! Go us. Um, yeah, largely because a lot of it, frankly, is still in development. And a lot of it, uh, there's a lot of shenanigans going on. Uh, and it's a lot of, I don't want to call it cloak and dagger. That might be overselling it a bit. But, um, you know, a lot of stuff that has not been forthcoming about how this is supposed to work. You know, things like finding out there's a DRM standard, incidentally, because somebody who does YouTube reviews of tuner boxes flagged this, and then the entire public interest community went, wait, what? Um, and, you know, and, and Cory Doctorow caught wind of it and raised to stink, and now that's how we find out about these things. So, um, you know, it's a complicated process. It is going to take a few years, really, to get the ball rolling. But as Corinne said, this is potentially enormous impacts on the public for a lot of reasons. And there's a lot more like weird hiccups around this version of the transition standard. The last time the DTV transition, the FCC had auction authority. So they could auction off more spectrum, which is how they got the money to then pay for paying for people's new tuner boxes. They don't have that authority to do that this time. So where's the money gonna come from? We don't know. Um, so it's a super complicated issue. Um, but now that we've got 20 some odd minutes, if folks want to grill us about any of this, we've got an open mic. Well, I'll bring up uh, another. Actually, um, I, I'm, thank you, everyone who came in. Uh, this issue at this point, I think is, it, seems kind of, it seems kind of wonky, but I have a lot of passion around this, and I'm sorry I couldn't put this in a, like a better time slot. I don't know that it would make a difference at this point, but I think we've got to get people to care. Um, and that's really the, the uh, issue. And I want to bring up another issue, um, and I'll try to do my best impression. Um, this is a test. This is only a test. <laughs> if this had been an actual emergency, you would have been instructed where to tune for, you know, all this stuff. Beep, you know, the beep. 
Um, so what I'm saying with all this craziness is there is also a public safety aspect to this that if you've got a tornado coming or if you have a civil defense emergency like the dam is about to break, broadcast was always the way that in the past that you would get the word out quickly and that you would get a quick response. Now we have these phones, but not everybody has them. And strangely enough, the younger generation is actually starting to turn away from some of these and go back to the dumb phones. So we kind of need broadcast still to fulfill this emergency. Um, you know, we had this whole, we had this whole, and it was government mandated, part of government policy that, that we had the emergency broadcast system. This was the, um, the replacement for, you know, 640, 1240 kilorad back way back in the, the, the war era stuff. Um, but you know that's that's a real aspect of it, and I think we need to ring the bell on that because that's mm -hmm. you know there are older people that don't have these phones, and there's younger people who are turning away from them. Um, and broadcast is sometimes all you've got left, so especially in the rural areas. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that point needs to be made. Absolutely, yeah, and I mean we see this in the radio too. I mean this comes up repeatedly at the FCC. I think one of the frustrating things about telecommunications advocacy in the last couple of decades is that people really do get blinded by these new business models, and they, you know, so we have situations where broadcasters are like, well, why do we have to do public interest obligations? Netflix doesn't have to do public interest obligations. It's like, well, because Netflix doesn't have a wireless spectrum license, like that is, and Netflix doesn't reach everybody, and I think. One of the frustrating things, and we saw this during the net neutrality fight, um, going in to talk to staff in policymaking offices and saying, you know, they would be like, well, I've got a choice of three ISPs. Well, it's because you live in Arlington, Virginia. Like, you know, you live near the nation's capital where there is, you know, it's a highly densely populated area where, frankly, the camp companies, the ISPs know that all the policy staff lives out there, and so they're going to be on their best behavior, and they're going to offer you as many choices as possible. But your experience does not represent the experience of people in rural areas, of people in tribal areas, of people, frankly, in under-resourced inner city areas sometimes, where there is only one ISP. And so I think it is difficult to bridge that gap often to under to tell people, you know, I have family members who can't, who they're, they have satellite broadband. And that's all they can do. And satellite broadband is like a wild misnomer to begin with, but they functionally don't have the kind of internet connection that all these policymakers tend to assume that they do when they talk about like, you know, deregulating broadcast obligations and that kind of thing. But it's, it, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, and now that we're seeing, you know, climate change, frankly, we're going to see more and more need, unfortunately, for the disaster alert system, um, you know, that needs to be very robust. And we can't just assume everyone's got an iPhone that's going to, and we've reduced the debate to who gets paid and how they get paid, and we're not thinking about the public interest on these very this very limited public resource. Mm -hmm. And um, I think we've got a whole new generation that needs to be educated about that too. So, absolutely. Hi there. Hello. Uh, I am one of those uh, wild people who has an ATSC three tuner. <laughs> oh, awesome! God it, bless. It was indeed two hundred dollars because that's the price that they are. It's the, it's the HD oh. Home Run, yeah, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. whatever. Theoretically, four tuners, but only two of them can actually do ATSC3 because something. Um, and so I, I live in Metro Atlanta, and there's a bunch of, you know, our stations are broadcasting ATSC3 as well, mm -hmm. which is helpful, I suppose, although I live very slightly downhill, so they're largely inaccessible. But if I raise the antenna up really high, I can get it. And there's no DRM on them right now, but the problem for me with ATSC3 is that although the video is encoded in HEVC, which mm -hmm. is pretty widely available, not a problem, the audio is AC4. A new codec, apparently, oh boy. from uh, Dolby, that is apparently substantially similar to the former codec. Like, mm -hmm. it's not really actually better, but it is different and has different licensing. Mm -hmm. And so no open source products can actually legally decode it. There's been a patch on the FFmpeg project for, like, two years to attempt to decode this, but they can't merge it because they will get destroyed. So if I ever record anything with, you know, my open source recording solution, totally fine, I can watch the silent movie of whatever I have recorded <laughs> because it just can't decode it. And that's, that was a great disappointment to me. Mm. But it's otherwise lovely, I'm sure. <laughs> ATSC3 seems like it's like, it's so close to being very good, except for these, all the little, you know, Christmas all tree the ways asterisks. In which it's not. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, you know, I, I appreciate you guys fighting the good fight. Here's another one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. That's good to know. So one of the mistakes they made with DRM and the D 
the DVD era was it was just a single key mm-hmm. per region, and eventually, you know, someone extracted it and printed it on T-shirts. Mm-hmm. Is the ATSC DRM, are they doing the same thing where there's a master key, or are they trying to do it more like, you know, your streaming service where they're public key, private key, you've got your own personal decryption key so that we don't have the one master key that gets loose again? So unclear. Um, I know that the actual encryption of the signal is done using Google WideFind. Um, beyond that, um, the the mechanisms on the DRM, which we're, to be clear, we're sort of using DRM in a colloquial sense of sure. like, there's the encryption component, which cable signals are encrypted too. Uh, so there's that's the one. And then the other is the like, and all this other you know, hinky stuff that you can do once vis-a-vis recording, et cetera. Um, I don't know how that is structured specifically. Um, getting answers around this stuff has been like pulling teeth. Uh, and there's a lot of, you know, this is one of those situations where um, public interest, at least, is fighting a little bit of an uphill fight for just the lack of technologists um, yeah. that get into this. And so we have to like make friends with a lot of engineers who can, who can sit down and explain this to the lawyers, which is who we are. Um, so you know, the short answer is I don't know. And we're still trying to figure that out. And I think ATSC two is probably hiding wherever IPv5 <laughs> is out hiding. <laughs> the one thing though, I mean, I do think you bring up a good point though, which is that, um, the one thing I think is inevitable is whatever, whatever encryption scheme gets set up, um, it will be broken. It's just a matter of how long it will take, but that is the thing that will happen. Um, and then we can continue the fun game where it's broken, everybody knows that, and technologists, security folks, would like to you know, actually take advantage of that to inspect these tuners, to check out what they're doing, to understand them better in order to protect the public. Um, but we'll need to get permission to do that from the Copyright Office because it's illegal to break DRM even for public interest purposes. So, I mean, I, it's it's really depressing having been in this business for a while. Like, we can see it all. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, and we just, like, but the other thing is because we've all been around, we've learned some things, maybe actually we could stave it off because we can see it coming, um, which is hopefully, fingers crossed. So I am not an ATS3 uh, tuner owner, and I will never be one. So I'm a little outside of uh, this group. But I was trying to understand like what the difficulty is around getting information about this from the uh, you know the standard setters. Uh, so I it, it that seems to have come up multiple times that it's yeah. like a, a struggle. So I yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the way that the process has, has gone is generally that, um, and I, I can't speak to the DTV transition because I was not in this space at the time, um, but essentially what happened is a bunch of broadcasters got together and they developed their own standard. And then they handed parts of it to the FCC and said, please approve this. And the FCC was like, well, we'll approve this part and the other part. Um, and you can go do your own test broadcasts <coughs> in this. Um, and then when the FCC really started kind of putting their feet down a little bit one happened to coincide with the last election um and uh two basically was when the broadcaster said well we need you to start we need you fcc to start basically forcing people to transition over to this new standard um and there this happens a lot so to zoom out this happens a lot in the legislative context where essentially stakeholders will write the bill and then just hand it to lawmakers and say please pass this um, and then it will, you know, sometimes it'll go through negotiations, sometimes it won't, sometimes it'll get challenged, sometimes it won't. Um, but this is a process that we see happen quite frequently. And it's essentially, you know, the FCC has said, look, you guys have a lot of work you got to do on this. You know, partly it's, they came up and said, please enact this. And partly the FCC is like, you guys sold a lot of stuff you got to talk out. So please go do that over there. Um, you know, I think in an ideal world for broadcasters, they'd just write it and then they'd get it rubber stamped and then the FCC would start forcing the transition over. Um, and that's where public interest, you know, there there are very few groups who get into the kind of technical nitty gritty about this stuff. And I think it, they always sort of, um, broadcasters are always a little bit of a shocked Pikachu meme uh, whenever we show up. Um, so it's like EFF, public knowledge, 
there's like two or three others. It's a very small universe. I joke that if my, my colleague Harold got hit by a bus, the number of people who would understand spectrum policy in Washington, D.C., who don't work for a trade organization would decrease by 50%, like immediately. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, this is like really where one or two people make a huge difference. But again, PK, we're mostly lawyers. We don't have any staff technologists. And so a lot of this is having to kind of force access to, can you show us the 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 agreement the like a3sc which is the licensing body that actually hands out the they don't actually the stickers actually come from somewhere else um ironically but they're the ones who set the standard and have to check off compliance they're like can you show us the standard and they're like uh, we don't wanna and then there's some heel dragging involved so i, I had a question about that then yeah. uh, so to the extent that the fcc has to approve the standard how are they approving a standard they do not have the full text of because they've only been asked to approve a few bits of it. Yeah. Um, and then some are technically, theoretically voluntary, but they're not actually voluntary. If you want to get, if you want to be able to produce a 3P, 3.0 like tuner, you have to agree to the whole thing. But the FCC, because they have not stepped in and said, and said we can now force this onto new devices, they haven't had to approve the entire bucket. And the, the one thing I would just I think, I think Merida's actually being a little extra nice. <laughs> um, <laughs> I so, think I am rarely accused so of. So I know. Um, but so part of it is like, but I think your key question is like, why is it so hard for just to get access to the whole thing so we can pick it apart and understand what it is? Part of it, I think, is because there are parts of it that are genuinely being negotiated in like in these working groups. But the other thing is that these working groups, and this happens a lot in D.C., um, Part of the condition of the conversation is that you're going to keep a lot of it confidential and you're not going to name names. And you could see why that happens to some extent. People need to be able to speak a little bit freely. And if they feel like they're going to get quoted tomorrow in someone's blog, like they're not going to speak freely. OK, I get it. But it also means that it creates a space where there can be a lot of game playing, especially, you know, and, and there's power asymmetries. Right. And so there's like folks like PK who are there trying to represent like the whole public interest, which is a lot of people. And and then there's some like really, you know, very, very well resourced players who can afford to go to working group after working group after working group meeting and work all this out. And there isn't anyone who's really forcing them like we can ask. And we can say, you know, we need this in order to participate in this conversation. But we, but it's hard to actually force um, the industry players to be as open as they need to be. Now, we will get to a point, I think, um, when the FCC is actually at the point of trying to present something for public comment, then we will have a thing because they have to actually, you know, present something that people can actually comment on. Um, so we'll get there. But for right now, it's just a lot of conversating. And to be honest, I think it's an effort to sort of play the long game because I think well-resourced players realize that less resourced players, you know, are going to get tired. Harold might retire, <laughs> you know, or whatever, right? It's uh. like, no, but I'm just saying like they can play a long game. Um, not that they, they want this to happen quickly. I'm not saying they don't, but they are in a better position to play games than the public interest community, we win when we activate the grassroots, which we have had wins that way. Um, but at this stage, it's hard to do that. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have two <clears throat> disparate questions. Uh, so th the first one, though, is um, free speech. Mm -hmm. uh, this isn't about limiting free speech, but is would this be considered limiting the availability of ways to get your free speech out if they take away broadcast um, and you're, say, a small political campaign person, you know, you can probably still broadcast on radio, but TV has gone, right? Because now it's all uh, corporate run there's no pbs public broadcast system right like is is this something that should be we should be concerned about like with, there's no more venues for free speech um i don't know that this particular transition would shrink the space for for speech exactly um i mean i think you'll still have PBS. You'll still have community programming. It's just what you don't have 
is as a viewer um, as much control over how you access all of this different kind of information. Um, so I, I think of it as like, you know, the First Amendment also protects the right to receive information. And, um, and that, I think, gets more and more controlled in, mm-hmm. in the way that you receive information. So I think that there, there, there can be that kind of impact, but I, I don't, I'm not total, so it's more like the, in the sense of controlling how you receive and what you do with what, what, with what comes over the air. Um, traditional, you know, fair use rights to, you know, record stuff for your own purple, personal non-commercial purposes. I think that's the piece that's going to get more and more controlled. Uh, and that's what I, I would worry about a lot. There's also a thing, too, where the, the one thing that's nice about broadcast is this broadcast. You go out to the whole community. And um, where w- one of the things that's happened with the transition to cable is... Um, you know, they don't have any obligations to any communities. They can do whatever they want. And, um, you know, we're, we're moving away from that in a bunch of ways. But I don't know that this will make, the transition will make it that much worse. I think it's more on the other end of, like, the receiver. Okay. My, okay. So my, making sure that no one else wanted to ask a question. So <clears throat> my second question is around the security of these devices. So if we're going to be, for the first time ever, solar winds. We find out that foreign technology was used, right? But, and we found out after it had been, and log 4J, right? So after everything has been spread out, it is then um, used for bad purposes, right? So if we do another forced technology push with uh, media where the bulk load of citizens use it as their source of information, uh, are we setting us up for a risk of, say, a nation, nation state getting access, putting stuff into these boxes or the technology unbeknownst to us to then later control things like elections or media uh, vision of, say, a war or something like that? Like, What's the cyber risk on pushing technology like that? Maybe the wrong panel, but I mean, are people thinking about this stuff when they're discussing, like, forcing technology? Yeah, I know there are security discussions around these, like, digital protocols with, and this is one of the things that, so the FCC, when they are, so one of the fun things is if you've ever had, like, obviously, a, a TV, like a TV remote or a baby monitor, you can flip it over and see the little FCC sticker on the bottom. They have a team of engineers internally that test for a whole bunch of things. And in most devices, it is just, is this thing staying within the guardrails of the spectrum it is supposed to be using and not, you know, straying out and bumping into its neighbors? Um, with more complex stuff like TV broadcasts and, and DTV and um, really anything that requires, like, a substantial digital component. Um, There's a much bigger engineering team with much deeper expertise, and this is one of the things that they do talk about. Um, So they do monitor the security aspect of that when they go through and before they, you know, say like, now under our authority as the FCC, we mandate devices, you know, TVs must receive this kind of encryption or this kind of broadcast standard. That is part of what they look at. Um, As a practical matter, I don't know if there's anything unique to ATSC 3.0 that would make it more vulnerable to a bad actor attack like that. Um, There might be by virtue of the fact that it requires an uplink as well uh, for the interactive component, but I couldn't say for certain. But what I think you can say for certain is the way that we find out about all kinds of security risks is by being able to hack into our own devices Mm -hmm. so we can understand them. And whenever you get into this space around encryption, around DRM, you start seeing the arguments that say, no, you shouldn't be able to do that because then the bad guys will, you know, will pirate everything. And um, so we have to sacrifice some security in the name of fighting piracy. And, you know, that's a long story we've heard for decades now. Um, And I don't think it's, I think we have to push back against that and Mm -hmm. say like, I, again, I should be able to hack into my own device so I understand what it's doing. So not because I think a nation state is necessarily going to, you know, take over your television. I, that, I'm, that's not my number one worry. I just think you should know what your TV is up to <laughs> and what it's doing and where it's sending the information. What I could see happening is, you know, as long as, long as information is being collected about you, 
once it leaves your device, you don't control it. You don't know where it's going. You don't know what's going to happen with it. And it could get sold and or it could get just, you know, sucked up if it's not adequately protected. That's the kind of, the, to me, that's the real risk because it's just, it's now left your control and who knows what third parties will do with it. But I'm like just as worried with what, you know, a TV broadcaster and I do with it, you know, sell it to a location data broker, which they do or whatever. And, I, you know, I, I won't ha have any control over that. It's, so it's also worth noting that cable companies do have some guardrails on the kind of what they can do with the information that they collect about their users. Now, it's not my understanding is those guardrails are not terribly robust, but they are extant. Um, obviously, services like Netflix do not have that kind of guardrails. Um, and up until recently, broadcasters haven't really needed them because it's a one-way transmission. It is they stick up an antenna and they blast out a signal. They do not get pingback information. This is why Nielsen people meters were invented, so that you could figure out ratings because you did not have any backwards transmission of data. Um, ATSC 3.0 will change that. Like it, by design, it will it will have an uplink component that will be sending data back. And so part of the pushback that we've seen. Um, or coming from the public interest community is, okay, if you're exactly what Corinne said, um, my TV is now going to be explicitly sending information not just back to the TV manufacturers or to the you know Netflix or whatever app I'm using. It's also going to be sending it back to my local NBC affiliate. It's going to be sending it back to my local Fox affiliate. It's going to be sending it back to, you know, whoever the broadcaster happens to be. Ergo, um, there are certain privacy regulations that apply to folks in other kinds of um, like common carrier situations. The FCC is not a stranger to privacy, is what I'm pointing out. They have it in all these other areas. And so the discussion is like, well, okay, now it looks like it's maybe time to port some of those rules over the broadcasters, because all of a sudden we're going to need to for the first time. Um, and the broadcasters are not fond of that idea, uh, might be understating it. Uh, and their, their argument is, well, Netflix doesn't have any, so why should we? Uh, which misses the point entirely in my mind. To me, the answer to that is, well, how about Netflix should also? Yes. Yeah. How about everybody gets some privacy? How about everybody? Regulation? Privacy for everybody. You get a privacy law. You, you get, get a privacy law. I, I just <laughs> want to add that I'm worried about uh, remote sensing and, mm -hmm. and, and adversarial AI and electronic warfare uh, and how that's connected with the, uh, the, the standard. The Russian botnets in your refrigerator already. So, <laughs> I just wondered if you could expand on the ATSC 3 return channel, if, if for example, <clears throat> five years from now I buy a new TV, but I explicitly choose, n I don't plug an Ethernet cable in, I don't connect it to my Wi Fi, is, Will it work? is there one? Will I even be able to receive the ATSC 3 broadcast? Like, is, is there a hard dependency on a return channel to either? Undrm mm -hmm. the the signal. Um, or, otherwise, it sounds like it's not a whole lot different than the fact that if I plug in a smart TV now, you know, Samsung is right. receiving a, a a data feed. Yeah. So there's some debate about this. Um, there is a version of ATSC 3.0, the narrative coming from broadcasters, which says, yeah, if you just have a dumb TV with, you know, all the only thing you plug it into is a wall outlet to power it on, yeah. you will be able to get the programming, but you will lose some of the functionality, like the more specific geo-targeted, like uh, emergency alerts and the interactive capacity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the problem is that when you actually look at the ATSC 3.0 standard, one of the DRM things is called a round trip time check, which is basically that your TV has to, the, the ATSC tuner mm -hmm. on the end has to be able to ping the server with a time and say, as long as those two clocks match up, then you can continue to watch it. But that time check is like a precondition of you watching anything that comes down in ATSC 3.0. So in that sense, it would break. So there's two different versions. We're being told, yeah, no, it's fine. You just won't be able to do the fancy, shiny, interactive stuff. But also, there's this round-trip time check, and there's been no good explanation of how that would not break the entire standard if you didn't have an uplink component. And that's predicated on an internet connection. It's not trying to put will, a, a carrier back into the broadcast correct. channel. Correct. It will not be going through the spectrum unless you happen to be using a wireless. But no, it would be going through an internet connection, like an IP connection. Because I, you know, my folks live in a very rural area of, 
of Texas. They're well off. Mm -hmm. Internet just barely exists there, right. and and they are heavily reliant on over-the-air TV to get any programming. And if the internet goes down, and now I can't receive over-the-air mm -hmm. signals, this seems like a huge design yep. flaw. And that's one of the things that, like, you know, again, this is not what when we talk about the DRM stuff. This is not usually the primary fo and there's again there's a sea of issues around atsc 3.0 right now um we were mostly just talking about the drm stuff but this is something that like public interest advocates are very aware of um and trying to push back on you need to find a way to basically to be able to disable these sort of drm adjacent features that require yeah. that kind of uplink um you know because basically whatever we do has to be able to work in an area with zero internet connection and where the only thing that can access is over the air broadcasts um, and that is an ongoing debate about how to structure this and what kind of obligations need to be put on this thank you mm -hmm. so one thing i would say is so we're just about at time um and i do want to say just going back to what i was saying before like this is going to be a little bit of a long fight and there's a lot of it that is like techie and wonky and like the public interest folks our orgs, especially PK, is the star on this. Um, you know, we're in it. We're going to keep fighting. We're going to keep representing you. And the reason that I have, I have hope about it is because I remember 15 years ago, talking about net neutrality, you spent 20 minutes just explaining what net neutrality was and why anyone would care and what is broadband and, like, you know, getting there. And, like, now we have billions in funding to improve everybody's broadband net neutrality we don't have so much but we have it on the state level people get it it just takes time and so my guess is like we're going to be back here next year and there will be three times as many people and then we'll be here the year after that and they'll still be overflowing right it will, we'll keep building it up people will pay attention we'll come up with more fun words than atsc3 yeah we need to get fun words but 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 anyway like We'll get there, and um, but it starts with you guys being here and paying attention. Yep. So thanks. And, and understanding the words that we're saying. I mean, this is the vocabulary <laughs> building stage of legislation. Like we are just figuring out how to communicate and like build some understanding about this. But yeah, no, this is this is going to keep coming up, and you guys are now officially the tip of the spear. Uh, so thanks for showing up. <laughs>